Welcome to a special episode of Talking Feds, a roundtable that brings together prominent former federal officials and special guests for a dynamic discussion of the most important political and legal topics of the day. I'm Harry Littman. This week, we're recording from the Texas Tribune Festival. It's a huge event with hundreds of household names in politics and journalism gathered in Austin, Texas to participate in scores of panel discussions. The festival has a very broad span, but to my mind, there's an overarching question. What is the state of our legal, political, and cultural institutions after eight years of Trump rule and influence? And what are the country's prospects for purging that influence in the coming years? This special episode takes on those questions with respect to an industry of surpassing importance to the health and vitality of democratic rule, namely journalism. The journalism industry itself has independently been under great pressure since before the age of Trump. Predictions of traditional journalism's death are by now, you could say, old news. But the past two decades have seen very rapid changes in new business models, making the world of daily newspapers, three TV channels, and Walter Cronkite, one for the history books. And the Trump era added to these pressures with existential challenges to the core mission of journalism to provide truthful information. It's been a time of heightening distrust in news organizations, which MAGA Nation disparages as fake news, and a deluge of social media noise. So in this discussion, I want to combine a brief retrospective examination of the performance of the journalism industry in the last eight years or so, with a look forward at the role the industry should or could set itself in meeting the challenges to its own practices and to the country's restored health of emerging from Trumpism. And to address these topics, I'm thrilled to be joined by three of the most prominent and influential journalists in the country, whose diverse wealth of experience virtually maps the span of contemporary journalism. And they are... Katie Benner, who covers the Department of Justice for the New York Times. In 2018, she was part of a team that won a Pulitzer Prize for public service for reporting on workplace sexual harassment issues. And she has extensive and varied experience in the industry at many different outlets. And not least, she's a Talking Feds stalwart, including in our quarterly reviews of the DOJ. Always a pleasure to welcome you back to Talking Feds. Thanks, Harry. Dean Jelani Cobb, who's given us leave to call him Jelani, the dean of the Columbia Journalism School, a staff writer at The New Yorker, a political analyst for MSNBC, a documentary film producer, and I've just learned a amateur uh, shutterbug with a great camera. He received a Peabody Award for his 2020 PBS Frontline film, Whose Vote Counts, and was a finalist for the Pulitzer in commentary in 2018. He's the author of The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress, and To the Break of Dawn, a Freestyle on the Hip Hop Aesthetic. Thank you very much for joining, Dean. Jelani, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) And Jacob Weisberg, CEO, co-founder of Pushkin Industries, previously CEO of the Slate Group, co-founder of Panoply, and editor-in-chief of Slate Magazine. He's written for a long list of publications and is the author of several books. He's also vice chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists and a member of the PEN board. Welcome to Talking Feds for the first time, Jacob White. Thank you, Harry. I'm excited to do it. And, and if I can pr- promote myself, I took over as chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists in June, and I'm I'm here uh, at the Tribune Festival in part representing them. We're doing a, a panel tomorrow about journalists under attack around the world. Wow, that's great. Big job, actually, right? Yeah, around the world, you say. So that's part of that's part of the mission, not simply uh, in the states. Um, CBJ, just to get onto it briefly, yeah. is, is mainly internationally focused. When I first got involved in the organization more than 10 years ago, we did almost nothing in the U.S. because there was yeah. there was pretty maybe pretty some pretty marginal yeah. issues, but journalists have a lot of protections and didn't very often encounter physical danger doing their jobs. Since the Trump era, it's, yeah. a, it's a different story now, and mm-hmm. CPJ has been called to figure out how to protect journalists covering political rallies, dealing with a range of legal threats, violence. Um, the U.S. is unfortunately part of the world in which journalists are less safe than they once were. Which is a perfect segue to our discussion. So I wanted to 
begin with just a brief assessment of mainstream journalism's role in enabling the age of Trump. It's a familiar criticism that when he first emerged, he was a kind of buffoon, but a reliable attention getter, and at least some outlets gave him lavish uh, attention. Let me just put it this way. Um, how will journalism schools and history portray this period in terms of the, you know, the last eight years in terms of the performance in enabling uh, Trump and Trumpism? Any thoughts? Well, I think one thing that I'm always careful about is that when we talk about media, we're talking about very many different types of organizations yes. and entities and so on. If we're talking about the kind of banner marquee names uh, that drove most of the coverage, I think that you know, historians of media will likely be very, very critical of the way that we've operated in this moment from enabling uh, at the very beginning and almost kind of with a childlike innocence. And it's like, oh, you know, look what I brought home. And you're going, like, that's a rattlesnake. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and so uh, on the other side of it, though, is after it becomes clear what exactly we're dealing with, there's still an incredibly slow learning curve. Mm -hmm. You know, we were grappling with questions about whether or not fundamental things, whether or not you call a lie a lie. Um, and while our capacity to reach, you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people was being weaponized for the purposes of disinformation. Uh, and I think that part of the problem lies in the fact that we have had a very facile sense of the strength of American institutions and the kind of infallibility of American democracy, such that things that would be alarming in other places where they don't operate with those presumptions seem like background noise to us here. Uh, and we'll have a lot to answer for, I think, in that regard. I think that's so true, especially since one of the, one of the difficulties, I think, for a lot of big mainstream institutions, not just the press, was this incredulity. I can't believe somebody like this has has as much power as he does because we, the institutions, would never allow it. Mm -hmm. It would never happen in the world that we conceive of. Mm -hmm. And so it was really hard. And by we, you mean journalism or the whole panoply no, of institutions? The whole panoply of like traditional mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. institutions, right. journalism, like we, it, it was, it was a lot of incredulity. So then that gets to the point of how do you cover the president do you cover him as the man he is or as the office of the presidency? And I think for a long time, there was a lot of deference paid to the office of the presidency. Two reasons. One, it was reflexive. Mm -hmm. But two, it's because it represents an entire mainstream political party in the United States. So to write critically about Donald Trump implicitly says we are, we are not only criticizing a mainstream political party in ways we never really have before, but two, we are also implicitly saying this institution is much weaker than we've ever wanted to admit if this has happened, if so many barriers conceived of by the founding fathers. Who chooses our president? An educated electorate. Who's the check and balance? Congress. Those things are wiped away. That's a real question about democracy. That was hard for journalists to wrap their heads around. It was hard for journalists to wrap their heads around. In addition to that, one other thing I think is that there's a fundamental democracy problem, which is we never grapple with what to do in the instances where the majority is wrong or a, a, a plurality, even a sizable plurality is wrong. We reflexively grant a degree of legitimacy. If enough people hold the sentiment, we think that that sentiment has to be respected. As opposed to saying, wait, something may have actually gone off the rails. And even though there are very many people, millions of people, your dear auntie and your dear uncle who subscribe to this idea, they are dead wrong. And it is Hannah Arendt who points out that totalitarian mm. states are states that have the consent of the governed too, just like democracies. And so I think to your point, it's very ignorant and very naive, mm -hmm. maybe not ignorant, but very naive and very hopeful. To naive, think, right. Just because mm -hmm. a lot of people want it, it's mm -hmm. good. When you're looking at the media's role, I think it's important not to underrate the economic incentive. Mm -hmm. Trump was very good for business in 2016 at a time when a lot of the media business was doing very badly. And I think there was a short-sightedness. He was driving ratings. He was driving subscriptions at the New York Times and the Washington Post. And as a journalist, it was very tempting to think you could have it both ways. You could cover him aggressively, however you covered him. 
people were interested in following closely. But there were excesses that were really grotesque, I think, particularly the way he was covered on CNN, you know, meaningless coverage, but that, that was constant just because look at him. He, dr he drives the ratings. And the real question um, in the upcoming election is whether a lot of the media, not to overgeneralize about it, we are, we are, as you say, talking about so many different things, but whether they're going to fall into that trap again, because the same thing, the same motive will exist. And the thing about incentives is they operate when you don't think they're operating, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. they, they, they affect your behavior, even though you're not consciously doing anything to, say, advance Trump. But you want those readers, you want that revenue. Yeah. And one gloss on that is, you know, it's it's been said uh, that uh, Nixon wouldn't have needed to resign had Fox News been in existence. So the, the traditional outlets that you're talking about also had to deal with the behemoth that was and is uh, Fox News that seemed willing to stretch the truth and be, you know, strong supporters uh, of him. And I, I assume in kind of casting about for new viable models, you know, these guys across the street are printing money. It must have must have been a real sort of uh, challenge or temptation for the traditional models that, as you say, we're casting about for how do how do we transform to this new society, which some have done and some haven't. We've had polarization in news, but it has yeah. some specific qualities that distinguish it from the overall polarization of society. And I think to me, the, the, the most important one is that we have a traditional media, which the right thinks is left, but the, if, but the media itself does not think of itself as left. It thinks of itself as having responsibilities, rules, operating according to a set of standards. But the uh, conservatives have set up sort of these counter-establishment institutions that don't follow those rules and standards that are openly partisan. And they say, well, we're just the other side, but they're not the other side of, of the New York Times and CNN because the New York Times and CNN don't think of themselves that way. Not that they're perfect or free of advice, right. advice but you have a real asymmetry. I think there's a kind of feedback loop that happens here is that because people on the right, when we look at the decline in trust, there, there is an overall decline in trust. But it's very asymmetrical. It happens far more among conservatives, people who are on the, the political right, uh, than among centrists, the people who are on the left. And the kind of feedback loop that we're in is that because conservatives have the most cynical outlook on mainstream institutions, it creates a lane for Fox News to, and other similar outlets to play very fast and loose with ethics. And then just go, oh, we're doing the same thing the people on the other side are doing. But that's not exactly, to your point, that's not exactly, the, those two things are not the same, especially when we saw what happened with the Dominion case. Mm -hmm. Because at that point, uh, when you have uh, the blowback against Fox News reporters attempting to report what we know to be the verifiable truth about the election, and this is being held up by an overtly political agenda, at that point, you can no longer refer to Fox as a news organization. This is something else. Yeah. But it's complicated over at Fox, isn't it? Because yeah. they're, you know, to a significant extent, chasing their audience. Rupert Murdoch has a set of motives, and he's tried to get off the Trump bandwagon maybe more than once. And I think Fox has really been restrained by the partisanship of its viewers. And the, the Dominion case illustrated that really well. It wasn't a given. I mean, tr Fox was the first to call the election for Biden. It wasn't a given that they were going to take Trump's side in this in his ridiculous claims. But that's what their viewers wanted, and that's what they ended up doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we have time, I actually want to discuss whether the sort of blunderbuss of defamation law, which hits rarely but hits hard, that you know, is really plays much of a role here. But let, so let's now change our vantage point and look forward, having given Dean that D minus or whatever it is to journalism for the last eight years, and and now uh, trying to make amends, as it were. So I'd like to actually um, pose a question based on your own words, Jelani, which was. It's, it was easy to criticize that and say it was a disaster, and you were specifically talking about the CNN town hall. But I think the bigger question was, what have we taken as the protocols for covering an authoritarian uh, figure? And I, you know, I think that means starting you know, now in 2023. I wonder if you have an opinion on that question, or, or any of you do, of what should be or what the industry overall has now taken as the, as the protocols and if they differ. 
from the from 2015. I mean, I think we can see from some of these town halls, interviews with Trump, that these protocols are still being worked out in real time, and I don't think there is a protocol. I I don't want to speak for my whole newsroom, in part because I don't want to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> but I will just say that as a reader and consumer of tremendous amount of news, what I would like to see is more about, one, context for Trump, right? If what he's saying is... Um, a call and response to extremist groups. I really want to know that that's what he's saying. I don't want to just, I don't want just the quote. And I want to understand why that's powerful for him, powerful for him or why, how it impacts the Republican Party. And I would also love to know a little bit more because we did not do this. We haven't done this in so long. So I don't even know if political reporting is equipped to do this. I actually want to know about what life is like for voters and what they care about because it's certainly not the things that we think it is in D.C. And if Trump was not the biggest wake-up call that we can't keep ignoring what non-elites think and what they want and what they're worried about, whether you agree with them or not, whether you think it's good. Clearly, they were ignored, especially in political coverage, especially in horse race coverage around political races, to the detriment of elite institutions and of institutions, because then we ended up with President Trump, who has grabbed all the levers he can and is using them in extremely powerful ways and speaking to overlooked populations, even minority populations, in ways that I don't think the institutions really understand and that I, as a reader, don't feel that I understand. And I would love to read more about that. Mm, I don't think there's anything unique about Donald Trump. I think he's doing something on another scale. Um, you know, for the populations, there's a kind of old rubric of populism in the United States, and it looks a lot like. Uh, the alliance that Donald Trump has pulled together, not necessarily along, by the way, along uh, economic, socioeconomic lines. Uh, but when you look at uh, populist movements in the United States on the right, uh, you know, going all the way back to the Populist Party, what you have is a tendency toward a fairly accurate economic critique mixed in with a significant degree of lunacy. Mm -hmm. All of those movements, whether it was around uh, the silver uh, standard, whether it was around... Uh, a nail meter across the silver. Yeah. Uh, right, whether or not it was around uh, various anti-Semitic yeah. theories about the economy. There's always been uh, that kind of lunatic fringe mixed with actual economic critique element to it. Donald Trump did it on a scale bigger than than anyone had before him. I also think that he had the tailwind of the kind of resentment that Barack Obama had even existed yes. and a whole uh, array of those other things. But to, to the point about the protocols, I think that we have to start everything with January 7th. For all of the debates we had that went back to 2015, there were things that we thought were outrageous. We were things that we thought were anti-democratic. We were things that we thought that were completely outside the bounds of politics, et cetera, blah, blah, blah. We, we, we've litigated all these things. The one thing that we cannot uh, say reasonable, pe reasonable people disagree about is a mob storming Congress at the behest of a candidate who lost. Everything else that we do in our coverage has to flow from that. Journalists are, uh, are within their rights to proceed as if everything he says is a lie. The standard of proof should be for him to prove that he is not lying, as opposed to the presumption, not the 50-50, maybe you're telling the truth, maybe you're not, which is a kind of good place to begin. But we should begin saying this is a person who attempted to overthrow the government. And that is how we should start. Um, that's how we should be in the middle. And that's how we should be in the end of every interaction around him. My, my concern is just that in an environment as polarized as, as this one, the the persuadable electorate is so small and people have made up their minds to an extent that it falls on deaf ears. And in a way, um, although everything you say, Jelani, I absolutely agree with, the, the more times you call him a liar, the less impact it has. The first time the New York Times used that term, it had tremendous impact. Time number 127, it starts to look like partisanship, even if it's simply an accurate depiction. Well, I, I, think you've he, got to, I think you've got to do it. But, like, but, but, but we yeah. do, your doc, do that. Your doctor's like, I've told 50 people today that they have cancer. I'm yeah. just not going to tell them. <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is, we're, we're acting like people don't 
speak about Trump in the media when interviews are done with him from that presumption. Absolutely, that is the presumption. Yeah. If you look at the dialogue around any of Trump's two mainstream media interviews, it is always, well, we know that everything we, that he says is a lie, which is why we at this news organization are going to fact check him all along the way. Everybody goes into this saying he's a liar. That is already including happened. a lot of his supporters, including his supporters. What is diff What is interesting is that his supporters do not care. They accept it. They're like, hundred <laughs> percent. He is lying, a hundred percent, and we don't care. And, and you are too. They but, think yeah, everybody yeah. else is. Yeah. Right, but, that, right. but, but, yeah. but that's why I'm so curious about like, well, what is that support? What are we not understanding about supporters? You're right. This isn't new, and we can say there are all these historic um, historic precedents for this kind of thought. But what is it about that thought today that's so resonant? And I, I would just like to read more. <laughs> and like Trump, we know he's lying. In and my own little world, likes yeah, this it. is playing out in the in with all the trials and the great hope that people have that oh, if there's a conviction, oh. that will be a game changer, no. and it's very oh, possible. The acquittal will be the game changer. The conviction will mean nothing. There won't be an acquittal, but I hear your point. <laughs> well, there probably yeah. won't be a verdict in most of these cases before, before the election, but it's going to be the yeah, it's going to be yeah. the backdrop to everything, people, and that's yeah. that's totally un unprecedented. I don't know. I don't feel at all comfortable making any predictions, but certainly predictions about how that's going to play out in the campaign. Yeah. The dynamics that I'm still really concerned about in the coverage are um, one the. Uh, Michael Kinsley was my mentor in journalism. Used to say yeah. the first rule is the story has to change. Journalists want drama. Someone who's up has to be down. Someone who's down has to be up. They don't consciously drive that, again, to yeah. the incentives. But it isn't news if the story is same as last week. Yeah. Um, and so we're just it's just inevitable that there are going to be these Trump's going to win. Maybe he's not going to win. Maybe he's going to win. And we're going to have that up to the election day. The other is, you know, and I think this has become a real distraction, but the idea of the horse race has become scientific. The idea that, you know, polling, meta-analysis of polling provides this predictive window um, and that now there's almost a, a, a kind of science or effective social science ar around journalism. And I think it, it, it's a total distraction from policy. And when I covered presidential politics, I wrote mainly about policy. It's pointless to write about policy now because nobody's interested. Um, and I just think it's a... It, it's a hazard when everyone in the country just becomes obsessed with state by state polls, electoral math, and you're you're not talking about any of the substantive issues in the campaign. I think that we're called to do something irrespective of what the consequences are. Yeah. And I mean, of what the readers want. We get the readers, readers stories want. they don't right. want all the time. Right. The front page of the New York Times is foreign news that many people might not have been asking for, but we believe that it's important for our readers to be exposed to and given the opportunity to, and sometimes forced to read about mm. something they're not interested in happening in you know, countries around the world they may not be paying attention to. So why not do that domestically? I, I have had the experience, I think lots of parents, if not all parents have had this experience, of spending a lot of time preparing a meal that you put down in front of your child, <laughs> and then that meal gets put almost untouched into the trash. Yes. And I have resolved <laughs> that I have met my responsibilities. Like, my, the law only says I have to put this plate in front of you. And whatever happens after that, like, I am not negligent. I feel like we need to have But that you're not room. going to the 30-second microwave uh, uh, solution. And you're not giving yeah. your kids I'm, I'm Skittles gonna, for yeah, dinner every night just cake. because your kid <laughs> right. wants Skittles. Exactly. Yeah. They'll <laughs> right. remember you kindly. Um, I wanted to pick up on the point you just made, Dick, and it, and it dovetails with what, um, well, everyone's been talking about, uh, about the relationship in, uh, you know, today between the sort of elite outpost opinion journalism generally and coverage of policy. So you've uh, said that uh, a current, I think, affliction is the word uh, you used in, in prose journalism is writing toward winning prizes rather than for the audience and for length over um, conciseness or concision. So do is that a current problem with respect to this issue going forward? I, you know, what is the role of the elite opinion journalist who, you know, maybe gets, I, I have a, I have a week could call them in the LA Times, maybe 20 people read it, I don't know. But what in this whole uh, effort and is it to the um, detriment or an ignorance of the the point Katie was making about you know vote the vast sea of voters or the plurality that Jelani referred to who seem impervious to a lot of 
the news coverage. I mean, it's not even it's not even relative to the things we've been talking about. Right. It doesn't begin to rate. It's not a problem at all. It's more <laughs> a kind of insider's critique of some journalism yeah. that a lot of it seems to me to be you know, written for other journalists or prize committees as opposed to readers. I mean, the joke used to be the most depressing words in journalism are first in a series. <laughs> <laughs> and, and uh, you know, the, um, there, are, uh, there are pros and cons to, um, to British journalism, but there are things I love about it. Yeah. One of the things yeah. I love about Points it is, view. in yeah. newspaper point of view, stories don't jump. You can do another story, but you have to digest it down to what's on the page. I've never, I've been a New York Times reader since I was like 11 years old, <laughs> getting reading it the next day in Chicago. And I've still never understood six or seven stories start on the front page. Are you supposed to pick them up as you read, turn all the pages? Or do you flip back, toggle back and forth between the jumps and stories? It's just not, it's, it's yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, those are the we only have Marshall yeah. McCool and those are just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of concision and, yeah. you know, getting the information we need. I love, you know, uh, uh, sites like uh, Axios and, and Tortoise Media in the UK uh -huh. that are very, very focused on, on kind of smart th synthesis. It was a big part of what we always tried to do. Slate is digest things down. So they're actually useful to read. It doesn't mean there's not a place for, you know, Jelani's long stories in the New Yorker. I love those stories. That's what I do in the weekend is I get in a hammock and read them. Um, but thank you. I <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> only Jelani. Yeah, no, only mine. Though, right? <laughs> <laughs> I read, I read a lot. I read a lot of them, but I, you know, but I, but sometimes I think, you know, it doesn't always serve the, the immediate needs of the, of the news consumer. This feels related to me, at least obliquely to, to a call that you've made Jelani for a more democratic uh, journalism industry. I, I wonder what that kind of means in practice in the sort of current landscape and the overall problem that we're talking about, of, you know, journalism's responsibility to combat or, or cover uh, the age of Trump. You know, I think that means a lot of things. Um, you know, for one, I think that we have a real serious need to diversify journalism. Um, in terms of certainly in terms of race, in terms of ethnicity, still. and you mean reporters or subs or coverage? Both, both, yeah. both. editors. Yeah, too. editors, yeah. really editors. Um, Socioeconomic class. Yeah, you know, journalism used to be a kind of working class profession. It's very much more professionalized now, and it has a very. I mean, I'm the dean of Columbia Journalism School. Like, I understand. Like, um, you know, what has come from the professionaliz professionalization of journalism, but it also we have to have the vantage point of people from a whole array of experiences. You know, people who are veterans, uh, people who are immigrants, people who are, because journalism takes up human affairs, we need to have as wide a perspective on human affairs as possible. That's why for, for my deanship, the thing that I've been focused on is making journalism school more affordable. Um, mm -hmm. We have this crisis of higher education, which is another institution people don't trust anymore. Right. I was talking with someone recently who, who said, you know, the United States was from, someone from abroad. And so the United States has the finest universities in the world. I don't understand why you all don't trust them. It's like from, <laughs> we're looking at you going like, look at all of this education, this, this edifice that you've built. And, you know, we're here going like we don't trust anything that comes out of you know, higher ed. Um, so there's that. Uh, we have this institution wide crisis in terms of affordability, which has fueled the contempt and resentment that people feel toward us. I'm not in charge of all of higher education. I'm just in charge of Columbia Journalism School. So that's where I'm making my intervention on this issue. But I think that to so the last thing about going back to the point about populism, when we look at this sliding scale of trust for all of these major American institutions, there's a fundamental question about whether or not we actually deserve the trust of the public in the first place. Like we have failed people in so many ways that we, they have now turned to people who are giving them soothing lies. Um, because if they're going to be lied to by the institutions that we are allegedly trustworthy, um, then, and then they've lied to other people, they will at least go with the lies that make you feel good. Yeah. That their friends tell them. Right. right. Well, it's interesting, too. It's sort of like, what is the job of some of these bigger institutions? And I think that within the media industry, decimating local news has had an effect that we're still reckoning with. You know, if you, Pew, Pew has all this research about how even though people don't trust media, they still trust local media yeah. because they know the reporters, they right. live in their town, and they're covering things that, that 
readers and viewers see with their own eyes. I was at that basketball game. Mm-hmm. Indeed, that is exactly what happened. Mm-hmm. I was at that school board meeting. Yes, that is exactly what happened. There was tons project, yeah. of trust. And is it the job of the New York Times? I, I didn't grow up reading the New York Times. I grew up in rural Vermont in mm-hmm. a blue-collar town. We read the Rutland Herald and um, the Brattleboro Reformer. And maybe if you were getting crazy, a Burlington newspaper, but they were, you know, they were very elite in Burlington, so we kind of ignored them. But that's where trust was built, and that's where trust exists in the media. We don't have that now. And in part, I think it's been exacerbated by the death of local news. Because which, which is not coming would, back, right? You've and, talked about news deserts. And, and, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it was yeah. the job yeah. of the New York Times right. in the 1990s right. to reach my family. My family did not care about anything the New York Times put on the front page, truly. We're not reading the opera section. We're not reading the art section. We're reading about what my high school band is doing and that was yeah. that was enough but we were still connected to news and so i don't think that it's the job of the times the washington post and you know the la times to be reaching into communities like mine in vermont and need necessarily building that bond of trust i wanted to get my news from my local town i think one of the things you realize if you live in a smaller community is it's not just that the local news is essential it creates the community sure. there is no there sure. is no community Without news, because it is the it is the common ground people understand, and whether it's the the high school basketball scores or the you know the board meetings, it's all of those things. And there has no substitute for it has emerged. And I think what you see in places that have become news deserts is a tremendous degradation that goes far beyond the news. It's of the community itself. And Listen, there's one thing aspect of it. I'll just say as a former prosecutor, which there seems to be no one to do the hard work of like the bond issue that is fact that is corrupt and i mean journalists in local news states actually actually function as sort of investigative entities that there seems to me to be no replacement for sorry i'll take this a step further i will tell you that the crisis of american democracy is a local one yeah um when we go back to thomas jefferson and his views of democracy clearly you know, things that i'm not on board with but this idea about the the strength of locality was dead on I did a talk to a group of healthcare practitioners. Um, and we were talking about this common uh, issue of loss of trust. I pointed out that people trust local media, precisely the kind of media that's gone away, much more than they trust national institutions. Americans have never really trusted large national institutions. Going back to Grapes of Wrath, where they distrusted the banks. So if you go back a generation before that, they distrusted the railroad trusts. Yeah. Uh, the large, faceless Social national media. Yeah. The, now it's like it's Medi- tech yeah. and media and so on. But I was saying to the, the medical practitioners, I said, no one believed you when you told everyone the vaccine was safe. And then the Biden administration said, Joe Biden said, take your personal physician's advice. And I was like, 100 million Americans do not have a primary care physician. That's your version of the local problem. And so when we go back through all of these entities, and even another strange one, which is like the institutions that people do trust, small business, Mm -hmm. they trust the police generally, which confounded me because I've written a lot about like problems with policing. And then I was like, maybe this is a racial thing. They're polling like more white people than they are polling black people. And then I thought it was like, no, it's not that. It's a local thing. There are 18,000 police departments in the United States. Most people, the average police department has smaller, fewer than 40 cops. Most people who are interacting with the police are interacting with a cop whose kid goes to school with yours. Getting the cat out of the tree. That's right. I was They're in the Western District, right. 625 different police departments. In the, yeah. Right. They're, they're having these local relationships. And that's where, in terms of addressing this crisis, that's where it has to begin. If it has a face, if it has a local face, then people think of it fundamentally differently. So I think if you look at it in you know, social science terms, trust in institutions has been in decline since the 1960s. And it applies to all institutions. Mm-hmm. And the question of whether you call it an institution will give you a pretty good indication of whether <laughs> people have lost trust <laughs> in it. And it's local different. news isn't really an institution in the same way. Yeah. It, you know, And the local police force isn't an institution. Mm-hmm. Congress is an institution. The the courts are an institution. The New York Times is an institution. National journalism is in a lot of ways, but local is is people you know and things that are that are immediately relevant and necessary in your life. This is that's such a great point, and it opens up. You know, this is the first in a series that we won't be covering, <laughs> <laughs> just because I want to be sure to focus on the the Trump issue at hand. So I want to say one thing about the uh, everything we've just said, which is we haven't 
even address the incredible sort of uh, departure of young people to as even consumers of news and how you ever get them back. But that said, I want to ask everyone's thoughts about whether journalism's mission is altered in this sort of pivotal moment, because you hear sort of two distinct schools of thought on the question of how serious journalists should or shouldn't reconceive their mission in light of Trump. So there's the balance or objectivity. Should, should journalists seek to promote, defend democracy and therefore, you know, call out who Trump is and the and the signal change that January 6th represented? Or do they just, you know, put one foot in front of the other as truth tellers and hope that that mission then instrumentally gets the job done in the broader political front? Are things different for journalism now in this very uh, fragile political cultural moment that we face? I could take a first stab yeah. at it. Um, everyone, everywhere in the world, I think we're seeing that independent journalism and democracy are 100% correlated. You can't have democracy without independent journalism, and without democracy, you're not going to, the reverse is true. Um, and journalists can't be neutral on that. And so they can't be neutral about democracy because there's no hope of practicing journalism without democracy. Um, and I think, you know, when the, when you're confronted with a, a authoritarian populism in this country and elsewhere and fundamental threats to our democratic system, you, that's not partisanship to me. That's that's a that's an absolute consensus in the society, which is being bizarrely violated by by a huge segment of the electorate. The electorate. Yeah. So that's interesting. So you actually fight, you, you take the opposite position from the Fox news crowd that, it, that in some degree, when we were talking about it, we, we thought of it as being driven by giving the audience what they want. So here you have to like tell the audience what they what they should want. Well, it's a, it's a complicated symbiosis, yeah. but I guess I, my, my perspective is you can't blame Trump and let his supporters off the hook. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think that when we go back to what Walter Lippmann meant, um, when, you know, he kind of advanced the idea that came became objective journalism. Uh, it was more about being disinterested uh, in the outcome, not uh, having favor toward any political outcome. If, it, if there's a uh, you know city council member who's taking bribes, it doesn't matter whether that person's a Democrat or a Republican or an independent or whomever. And so it's kind of disinterested in that way. And also that you would practice journalism in such a way that another journalist could effectively come along and replicate your results if they, you know, followed a story. The idea of being a kind of voice of God, you know, dispassionate individual that has no biases, that wasn't what he was articulating. What Lippmann was articulating. What Lippmann was articulating. Yes. So, so we wound up with a kind of theory of objectivity that never really started it's like the word literally now like <laughs> people use the as word as a literally. parent you know when you're when your kid says that it's going to be not it's literally not literal <laughs> right exactly well I mean, the, the meaning of it has really changed from Lippmann, i think is 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 what you're saying and i strongly agree with that i mean you know the idea the original idea of objectivity is be more like a scientist don't be misled by your biases right. don't be misled by what you want to be true see what's in front of you and describe it. And that got dumbed down to the idea of there are two sides to every exactly. question. Right. We'll represent them equally and that will look like the lack of bias. It's not the lack of bias. And I think it also came That's out of a culture. such an important point. Yes. Yeah. And it came out of a culture of newsrooms that were really dominated in large part by people who are white and people who are men for mm -hmm. whom a lot of these really difficult questions around how people were treated and how their lives, um, how they were living their lives felt, you know, I've had so many conversations, especially when I was covering Silicon Valley with people who would say things like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a problem today. You know, the abortion question is a problem today, but it will work itself out. And <laughs> we're going to have an uncomfortable eight to 12 years. And I'm thinking for you, this is an uncomfortable eight to 12 years through an historic lens. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's not what this is for so many people, mm -hmm. men and women, frankly, who are dealing with this on the ground in a way that you're not going to for a variety of demographic reasons. And mm -hmm. so I think that that also perpetuated this 
well, this side or that side at right. all. It's just a pendulum swinging back and forth. That point of view, it's really hard to have. This is just a pendulum swinging back and forth point of view on questions about things like, should we end Jim Crow when you are living in the South? And so the, it it's, it comes from, again, Jelani's his expre him expressing that we need to have far more diverse newsrooms in order to really understand how best to tackle this thorny problem of Trump. And well, so here you're calling out not simply a higher responsibility to just call the truth the truth, but actually to be a, an advocate for certain democratic values mm -hmm. yeah. and how they impact a really wide array of people. But it's tr it's a tricky it's a tricky line because journalists shouldn't be can't be objective about Jim Crow or in many you know for yeah. for a lot of journalists abortion rights. But you have to be careful that you're not you don't let that very legitimate view mislead you about what's happening. So you don't want to be wrong about the question of whether Jim Crow is ending just because you want to end Jim Crow. Right. And right. that's that right. can be a real yeah. danger. Right. That's yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's exactly. exactly it. Yeah. And we saw that with the Mueller investigation. Mm -hmm. People from the minute Robert Mueller was appointed, people were writing, this is the end of Trump. Mm -hmm. That's the exact problem. They weren't writing that Mueller was appointed because serious questions had been raised and they needed to be investigated. They were writing the end because probably as members of institutions, they were so galled by Trump mm -hmm, that they mm -hmm. that they saw that as the inevitable end, because how could it be otherwise? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I agree, 100 percent. Yeah. You know, I think maybe we can circle back uh, to to the work of Penn uh, here, Jacob, and, and get... C CPJ, although I'm a big yeah, supporter okay. of Penn, <laughs> and Penn as well. Yeah. Maybe we can circle back to yeah. CPJ and give your thoughts then to other journalistic industries in even more besieged countries fighting even stronger strains of autocracy with less institutional uh, tradition to push back and ones that you think are, you know, exemplary and are an example of, of what you think is the now higher responsibility of journalism in the, in the U.S. in the age of Trump. You're talking about international yeah. in, institutions. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, there are Russian journalists in exile now who've been absolutely heroic. Oh, yeah, um, certainly. And um, in all of these large linchpin countries, Turkey, Brazil, India, obviously, China's is a little bit of a different story, but, but Russia. 10, 15 years ago, you, the hope of, for the society was expressed in the emergence of independent journalism. And they didn't have the First Amendment. It wasn't the United States. but you were it was it was growing and it when brave journalists were leading that and since put a year on it i'm not sure 2004 2008 2012 but for a decade or more it's paralleled the democratic recession it's been going in the wrong direction and journalists are very often the canary in the coal mine yeah. you see you know jorge ramos who's a who's a journalist mm -hmm. who's been uh put in prison in, in guatemala guatemala's you know, would be a pretty rough democracy, but it is like India, democracy. And when they throw an opposition journalist in jail, you say that's not a democracy. Not doesn't look much like a democracy right now, and or may not it may not be much of a democracy for long. And now a word from our sponsor, the American Civil Liberties Union. Hello, I'm Lauren Johnson, director of the ACLU's Abortion Criminal Defense Initiative. Let's be clear, those who want to end access to abortion care did not stop at the reversal of Roe v. Wade. Prosecutors and politicians across the country are now threatening criminal penalties against providers, helpers, and in some instances, those who access abortion care. The attack on reproductive freedom continues, and we will not stop fighting back. In addition to the work the ACLU is doing to stop laws that ban abortion, we're working alongside other reproductive legal rights organizations in the Abortion Defense Network to provide critical legal defense support. The ACLU's Abortion Criminal Defense Initiative is mobilizing a network of skilled criminal defense attorneys to defend people facing criminal investigations or prosecutions for providing, supporting, or obtaining abortion care. Those facing prosecution related to abortion care deserve a zealous defense. They will not stand alone. All right, it is now time for a spirited debate brought to you by our sponsor, Total Wine and More. Each episode, you'll be hearing an expert talk about the pros and cons of a particular issue in the world of wine, spirit, and beverages. Thanks, Harry. 
In today's spirited debate, we whip through the whiskeys to find out the difference between the three main types, scotch, bourbon, and rye. Whiskey, spelled without an E, is produced in Scotland and Canada, whereas whiskey, spelled with an E, means it's produced in the U.S. and Ireland and includes scotch, bourbon, and rye. It's these grains that help define which type of whiskey it will become before it eventually lands among the thousands of bottles on the shelves at your local Total Wine and More. Now, let's talk about scotch. Scotch is typically made from malted barley, blended with other grains, and that helps give it a little bit of a bite, making it more in of acquired taste. Bourbon must be made from at least 51% corn, produced in the U.S. and aged in new charred oak barrels. The oak gives this brown liquid its signature sweet flavor. And then there's rye, which must be made from at least, yep, you guessed it, 51% rye. Rye is a type of grass in the wheat family that has a spicy, edgier flavor, adding a little extra kick you may not find in a bourbon. For a true test of bourbon versus rye, we recommend you pop into Total Wine, maybe grab a bottle of scotch while you're here. But to really get to know the differences in scotch, bourbon, and rye, start by talking to the guides at Total Wine and More, who are more than happy to talk day or night about whiskey, with or without an E. Thanks to our friends at Total Wine and More for today's A Spirited Debate. Final question then, because you referred to this, Katie, as kind of a moving target. To what degree is the conversation we've been having over the last hour actually taking place within the ranks of journalism? Are people in some methodical, strategic way deciding and uh how to approach and deploying their decisions? Or is this rather very sort of, you know, pell-mell and not reflective at a time when I take one of the messages of of this discussion to be, it it, it needs to be? Yeah, you know, I think it's both. Like, so we have to figure out how to cover campaigns and there are going to be edicts that come down from on high in every newsroom. We do this, we don't do that. And so those will be the product of planning sessions and thought and debate just like this. And then there's the fact that institutions are all made up out of people who are actually doing the job. And those people on the ground are going to have their own thoughts and ideas, their own lines they don't want to cross, their own discomforts. And they'll be having those conversations with their peers. And so you're going, this is just, this is not just happening on a, an an institution um, based high level discussion framework. It's just, it's the daily lives of reporters every day wondering, okay, well, is this, how do we do this? He just threw a total monkey wrench into this rally. What do we do about this? I mean, that's on the ground and you're debating with your there, So you actually have debates with it. Can I just call this a lie, please? Well, no, you need to say in the third graph to be sure, blah, blah, blah. Of course. You know, I think that Dean Bacay said something. He was a, a guest at the journalism school, I guess it was a year or two ago. And he said something uh, which seems obvious on the face of it, but when you think about it, it actually has you know lots of implications. So it's very hard to keep track of the big picture of what you're doing when you are chasing deadlines every single day. Like there's one thing that happens um, in the kind of microcosmic version, and then there's the big sweep, the big themes you know, what you're doing. And so, I mean, that's what an ombudsperson is there for and like a public editor and those kinds of, to think about those kind of big questions. But for the practitioners, I do have sympathy. <laughs> you know, it is hard to do that. Um, it's especially certainly at a large organization that he was talking about, possibly even harder to do it at a small one um, because you're doing 50 other things. And so- And try to survive financially. Yeah. So it's very hard to kind of, consider, okay, here is the highest ethical application of like what we should do in this particular moment as it pertains to this autocratic behavior. Um, and also I have to like hit this deadline at this point, <laughs> right? So it's, it is a, a, a juggling act that's, that's difficult to pull off. I think that we should be thinking about this beforehand, you know, to make a kind of crude boxing analogy. When uh, I used to train with a guy who would make you throw the same punch over and over and over and over and over. And I was like, what is the point of throwing the same punch over and over? He was like, so that when you're exhausted, you still throw it the right way. Yeah. It's like you train beforehand so that when you're under pressure, you still instinctively do the right thing. So we should be thinking about these questions before we're in the middle, like we're in a dispute over uh, what uh, state uh, legislature is going to do 
with their electoral votes and what that does to the uh, national tally and all these other kinds of things. Like if we had January 6th in six or eight state houses, as opposed to at Congress, like what would that have been? Like we would have been completely unequipped to cover that. And so that's why I'm, that's what I'm really advocating. There's an end, I think. Thank you so much, Jacob, Katie, and, and Jelani. I think this could go on for hours and hours, but at, at least the, the specific kind of connection to the larger themes of the Texas Tribune Festival uh, have been well plumbed. Uh, really appreciate your time. Thank Thanks, you. Eric. Really enjoyed Thank talking you. to all of you. A big thank you to our guests and to our very gracious hosts here at the Texas Tribune Festival, Evan Smith and his Cracker Jack staff who outfitted us with a terrific podcast studio for the day. And thank you very much, listeners, for tuning in to Talking Feds. If you like what you've heard, please tell a friend to subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts or wherever they get their podcasts. And please take a minute to rate and review this podcast. You can also now subscribe to us on YouTube, where we're posting full episodes, talking books, and other bonus video content. You can follow us on Twitter at TalkingFedsPod, and you can look to see our latest offerings on Patreon, where we post bonus discussions with national experts about special topics exclusively for our supporters. Talking Feds is a completely independent production, so if you like the work we do and are inclined to support the show, joining our Patreon is the best way to do it. Submit your questions to questions at TalkingFeds.com, whether they're for Talking Five or general questions about the inner workings of the legal system for our sidebar segments. Thanks for tuning in, and don't worry, as long as you need answers, the Feds will keep talking. Talking Feds is produced by Mal Meliez, associate produced by Catherine Devine, sound engineering by Matt McArdle, our research producer is Zeke Reed, Rosie Don Griffin, and David Lieberman are our contributing writers. Production assistance by Meredith McCabe, Akshaj Terbailu, and Emma Maynard. A special thanks for his help in all of these productions to Akshaj Terbailu, and our gratitude, as always, to the amazing Philip Glass, who graciously lets us use his music. Talking Fez is a production of Delito LLC. I'm Harry Littman. Talk to you later.